Well, hey, Harvest, so glad to have you as we continue our series, A Christmas Story. If you're watching online, thanks for joining us in your Harvest home. We're so glad you're there. We'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube page. Also go to Facebook and Instagram, harvest.247, and check us out there, and harvest247.org. Hey, we exist so that all people may know Jesus and grow with Him. And we're certainly excited that you've been uh, joining us here for A Christmas Story. Um, so I'm going to just hop right into it today. And it, we're going to be in Luke 2, 8 through 12. We are following the story of Jesus' birth bit by bit through the book of Luke. And I'm um, really excited to share with you this story today. And this is how Luke writes it in verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. So Jesus has already been born. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all of the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. So God chooses to reveal this news first to the shepherds. Now, this is an oxymoron. Uh, to reveal it to the shepherds because the glory of the angels would be revealed to a group of shepherds that were regarded as social outcasts. So in the time, uh, shepherds were regarded as a social outcast. They were not part of society. They were looked on differently. They were a class of people that had a bad reputation. So this would kind of be like Now, uh, God revealing Jesus to people who were in prison or things like that, that they just kind of have a a different, people have a different view of them. Uh, They're their own kind of class of people. They have a bad reputation. They're social outcasts. They were considered unreliable, and they were not allowed to give testimony in court. So God chooses to reveal the Savior of the world to a group of people who lack credibility. And you and I would never choose that, but God would. So it's interesting, at the birth of Jesus and at the resurrection of Jesus, a very similar thing takes place. I'm going to put my iPad down for a moment. At the birth of Jesus, God chooses to reveal this, His glory, in the angels to a group of social outcasts, people whose um, credibility is called into question. They're not reliable. They cannot give testimony in court, and that is the shepherds. So God does something very unorthodox and says, hey, go! I'm going to reveal uh, to the group that nobody will listen to uh, about my son. <laughs> well, at his resurrection, the exact same thing happens. It's just with a different group of people. When Jesus is killed, and then he uh, raises from the grave, the first people to see him are women. So if you're trying to cover up something, you would never have the first witness to be a woman because in that day and age, women, again, they were unreliable. They, uh, their testimony was not allowed in court. People didn't believe uh, necessarily what a woman would say. And so in two instances, at the birth of Jesus and at the resurrection of Jesus, two amazing miracles that bookend one another and the life of Jesus, the first witnesses to those are people that are unreliable. People that would never, we would never choose to share that news with. Because when you have great news, you don't go out and share it with the person that is unreliable. Think about it. If you have somebody, a group of friends, let's say, some neighbors, and you have some news that you want to share, the person that is considered unreliable, the gossip, the slander in that group, because you know there's always at least one, Um, you don't go and share that with them first because you know if you share it with them, then the story's going to get twisted and all of a sudden you're going to say, wait a second, that's not at all what happened. Well, that's the equivalent of what Jesus' birth and His resurrection are is that God chooses to reveal uh, this information to people that are unreliable first. And that is so countercultural. That is so counterintuitive to what we would do. But I think that it gives the validity of these stories uh, some, some more legs because here's why. 
When people try to say that these events didn't occur, one of the things is is that if you and I were trying to fool people for 2,000 years about the identity of a person, we would have tried to cover it up by sharing that information and corroborating with kings and, and, and people with great repute, not people with ill repute. And so God chooses people of ill repute to book in to amazing miracles in his son's life. And I think it's because God has a different purpose for these events than what we think they are. So God chose to display his glory through unlikely people. He chose to display his glory through unlikely people, shepherds and then women at the resurrection. Now, we're going to go back to Bethlehem in the manger. We spent time on Bethlehem the last couple of weeks. God uses, last week we said God uses the seemingly unimportant to make a lasting impact. So let's talk a little bit about the manger. The angel declared to the shepherds that they would find the long-awaited Savior in a manger. Some would believe that this is an actual cave. So think about this. When a royal family today has a son or daughter, it is massive news, okay? Huge news. And they roll out the red carpet and the Range Rover pulls up and there's major celebration in um, the country. And it's just this massive, massive event that everybody watches, that everybody knows about. And the most reputable news organizations cover it so that we can get the correct perspective of the event. So God sends His Son in two unlikely places, Bethlehem and a manger, because there was no room. Now, how many of us walk around today and offer no room for Jesus in our heart and in our life? How many of us fill our life with so many things that we don't have room for Jesus? Probably a lot of us. Because if we had a cup and our life was a cup, most of us live with zero margin in our life. Most of us live with zero downtime. And we live our life so full of things that when we do have that downtime, when we do have margin, we just want to veg out on TV or we just want to go to sleep. And therefore, we leave no margin for Jesus in our life. I would say that's probably the majority of us until something happens in our life and we say, oh my gosh, we need Christ, we need Jesus, and we begin to go in that direction. So what happens when there's no room in the inn, I think is almost a metaphor for there's no room in our heart oftentimes for Jesus, even people who profess to follow Him. So God chose to display His glory in an unlikely place, and God uses the unlikely to display His glory And I want you to get this because unlikely is God's method because His glory is His motive. Our glory is not, our our motive isn't oftentimes God's glory. But oftentimes the reason why God's method is so different is because He is using a different method Something counterintuitive, something countercultural, something that we wouldn't do because his glory is his motive. Uh, John Piper, uh, an author, a pastor, he's now retired as a pastor, he's still an author, a professor. He says this in, in this quote about the glory of God. He says, The glory of God is the infinite beauty and greatness of God's manifold perfections. God in In a class by himself, he has infinite perfections, infinite greatness, and infinite worth. The glory of God is the manifest beauty of his holiness. That's what John Piper says about the glory of God. And so for God, when he sees these events, when he has these events happen on the earth... Unlikely is God's method because His glory is His motive. It's unlikely that He's going to call someone to spread out their arms and cause a seed apart. But He does that. Why? Because His glory is His motive. It's unlikely that three people could go into a burning furnace and live. But guess what? 
God's glory is his motive. It is unlikely that someone could play music and walk around a town and the walls fall down. But guess what? That's the God's method because his glory is his motive. It's unlikely that any one of us would choose to have the Savior of the world born in a manger because there's no room for him in the end, and for the, the announcement of that to be given to an irreputable group of people like the shepherds. God's method is unlikely, but that's because his glory is his motive. So when we think about how God does things in unlikely ways with, with uh, things that are different and counterintuitive, what we have to say is that God's motive isn't our motive. Our motive is oftentimes to arrive someplace safe. It's oftentimes to, uh, to have peace. It's uh, oftentimes to, to get what we want. But God's motive is for Him to be glorified. And the best way God can be glorified is to work through people in unlikely methods so that the only explanation is the glory and the manifest manifold holiness of God and so that He can be worshipped. So when we understand God's end game for Him to be worshipped, for Him to be glorified, then we can get some type of understanding or at least wrap our mind around the fact that that's why He uses unlikely methods. Because if He used the method that we want, we would just further glorify ourselves. So He's got to use unlikely methods so that it's inexplainable So the only option is to glorify Him. Unlikely is God's method because His glory is His motive. Go over to Matthew 5.16. I want to share one more scripture with you. Matthew says this, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So the good works that we are to possess is to display the glory of God on the earth in the same way that the glory of God shone all around the angels when they displayed themselves to the shepherds and gave them this good news. Matthew says in the same way, in the same way, that we are to let our light shine before others, not so that we get glorified, but for our Father in heaven to receive glory. And so why would God work through uh, disobedient, fearful, unfaithful people like me and like you? (laughs) Because unlikely is God's method, because His glory is His motive. And our motive and how we operate in following Jesus should also be not our glory, but God's glory, as Matthew says. That's the call for us to live our life in such a way that we are able to give glory to God and for others to see our light so that therefore they can give glory to God. We are an unlikely method. Me and you, we are an unlikely method. I mean, think about this. Acts 1.8, Jesus, right before he ascends, he says, look, you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Meaning his method, God's method to advance his kingdom and share the good news about his son goes through an imperfect group of people. Because he knows that if he can move through imperfect groups of people, the people aren't going to get the glory. He's going to get the glory. And so when we talk about no room in our hearts for God, it's oftentimes filled with things that give us the glory, us the satisfaction, instead of emptying our lives of ourselves so that God can ultimately get the glory as he shines through the works that we have to build his kingdom. And so unlikely is his method because his glory is his, our mo- is his motive. That's why serving is so important. One of our core values here at Harvest Church is serving is a get to, not a got to. Why? 
Because when people see others serving, self-sacrificing, giving their time, giving their talents to serve the kingdom, it shows them that God works through imperfect people, guilt-laden people like me and you, so that He can get the glory. That's why serving is so important. I'm just going to tell you right now, if you want to grow with Christ, you're not going to grow with Christ by just sitting around listening to things. You are going to grow with Christ by getting involved in personal ministry. That's how you're going to grow. It's the best way to grow. But it's the other thing. We believe worship isn't a style. It's a decision. That's another one of our core values. That God can use unlikely methods so that He can get His glory. That's His motive. And so no matter what song we sing... No matter what season we're in, we believe that worship is a decision. It is a decision to say, I might be in a difficult place right now. I might be in a valley right now. I may not like this song. We may have sung this song 10,000 times. This song might be 50 years old. This song might be one day old. But in this moment, it's not about me. It's not about serving me. It's about giving glory to God and letting Him receive the glory, the honor, and the praise. And therefore, I'm going to make the decision to do that where I stand. And so in the third part of this Christmas story, what we see is that unlikely is God's method because His motive is His, His glory is His motive. We see that the first recipients of this good news is an irreputable group of people. And it is an ulterior or alternative method that you and I would use. But that's because if God can move through irreputable shepherds and He can move through irreputable people like me and you, and that's the method He chooses, then He's ultimately going to get the glory on the earth because that's really his motivation. So this season, as we're looking for God in unexpected places, and as we see God use the small to to make lasting greatness, I also want us to understand that if you're going through something and you're questioning or whatnot, I just want you to know this. God's method is often unlikely because His glory is His motive. And what God is really wanting to do through your story and your circumstance and your valley or your mountaintop seasons is for Him to get the glory and not us. God bless you.